we continue with a Swiss artist, Ursula Biemann, in English. Uh, Ursula Biemann and it's, yeah, uh, studied in the UK in the 80s and in a, in a certain way... In New York. In New York, <laughs> yes. And, in, and, and during a time where Europe was sort of related very much to to aesthetic question in the 80s. She studied there in the beginning gender theory, uh, post-colonial studies, cultural uh, studies, and her topics are heavy political, uh, feminist issues, uh, lay questions of labor, and at the moment she is investing, uh, investigating a lot in the Arabic country, so her lecture fits in a certain way very good to what Leila spoke before. Thank you that you are here. Ursula, thank you. Thank you, Ingrid, also for this um, very nice uh, invitation. Um, your introduction sounds a little scary, actually. <laughs> um, but it's true that um, the presentation today uh, is largely based in a video called X Mission. It's a recent piece that uh, for which I have um, done a number of research and shooting trips in the Middle East, and it's on the epistemology of the refugee camp as an extraterritorial space. And I would like to uh, kind of bring back the discussion a bit to the notion of community as a complex uh, social entity, a bit like a system in and of itself, with the necessary demarcation that signals who is part of that system and what constitutes its specific environment. Because we shouldn't imagine communities as social clusters floating in an environment at large. Rather, every community constitutes its specific outside. So my interest in direct is directed towards how a community is formed, both from its inside and the outside, and through what mechanisms they are nurtured and maintained. I chose to examine a particular community, the Palestinian refugees. What is somewhat particular here is that the place they inhabit is by definition extraterritorial. These are designated spaces outside the national territory. In the wake of globalization, many such places have emerged all around the world where migrants, farmers, workers, and other um, sorts of communities experience very similar conditions. They live a state of exception. It is no longer a matter of ethnic distinction, really. What matters is the status as human being. These are little excerpts that I'm going to show in between. There's a big difference between the Palestinians and all other refugee groups. as human being, in who you are, what other people think you are, where you can live, how you can move, what you can work, if it counts what you say. The refugee is the victim, the stateless person, the non-citizen, the outlaw, post-political subject, the convertible figure, the paradigm shifter, the border concept, the anthropological subject, the agent provocateur, the guerrilla fighter, or the bare life that feeds biopolitics. Above all, the refugee is a highly symbolic figure that embodies the paradoxes of a world political order made of nation states.
first thing to look at is the legal dimension, perhaps, since refugee camps represent a specific juridical space. The Palestinian refugee case is interesting in this context because it's not only the oldest and largest refugee case to this day, but it was instrumental, instrumental in constituting the international refugee regime after the Second World War, which was to regulate all future refugee situations in the world. The most radical intervention performed by international law in case of crisis is that populations get suspended from the political and civil rights that used to govern their lives and instead become subordinated to the humanitarian conventions of the United States and the volatile domain of international politics. Because it was the first major case to be handled by the UN, the Palestinian refugees became the exception among the exception. UNHCR has a specific clause in its statute that excludes the Palestinians from its mandate. Because it was the United Nations that was primarily responsible for creating the Palestinian refugee problem in the first place, there is a particular regime set up for the Palestinians. And that regime was supposed to be a regime of what I call heightened protection, because not only were they supposed to have one agency, but they were to have two agencies devoted exclusively to them. It goes back historically to the first efforts that were made towards the Palestinians, uh, 1948, 1949. Uh, the first agency that was established is the UNCCP, the UN Conciliation Commission on Palestine. And the UNCCP was entrusted with a complete international protection mandate, but also a mandate to resolve all of the outstanding issues between the parties. At the same time, UNRWA was established a year later. It was given the humanitarian role of <coughs> providing food, clothing, and shelter, essentially. When it was clear that uh, UNC the UNCCP was not going to be able to make any change, any difference in the, uh, in the conflict, the UN, within four years of setting up the UNCCP, cut its funding significantly year after year until by 1952 the UNCCP was essentially truncated from its mandate of protection towards the refugees. Under the Refugee Convention, uh, the UNHCR has a very specific role vis-a-vis -vis states. It stands in the shoes of a state. Now, because Palestinians have no agency like the UNHCR, they have no access to international intervention. No one speaks for the Palestinian refugees in that same way. Uh, at the international level. They have no access to the International Court of Justice. I think this lacuna or protection gap has fit well with the power politics that's driving the negotiations. So the fact of an absence of any legal framework has been very convenient for the major political players. An incident not too long ago shows how fragile the status of the camp bound in refugee proves to be time and again. In the summer of 2007, while I was, uh, happened to be in Beirut, the Lebanese army breached international convention and entered Nadil Barit, a Palestinian refugee camp in northern Lebanon, to eradicate a small number of foreign Islamists who had settled in this isolated camp. The operation grew out of all proportions, and instead of securing the refugees' habitat, the army raised the whole camp to the ground, declaring it a zone of exception. It's the state of exception. Anything goes here. The camp was stolen, it was looted, it was destroyed. 
uh, there is no juristic uh, process which can hold anybody accountable to what happened there. Uh, uh, buildings that had nothing wrong with them, uh, battle is over, but they were destroyed. Rather than focusing on the ambivalent apparatus of sovereignty that rules the space, the video draws attention to the flexible process through which the refugees established a, established a community-based reconstruction committee to, reach the state, to research the state of the camp prior to its destruction and to draw up an accurate map that would serve as the ground for negotiations. These endeavors have created an informal political domain outside sovereign decisions to reveal a place where Palestinian refugees who are practically um, placed on the outer reaches of international law can unfold self-authorized constructive means through which to reinscribe themselves into a wider political fabric. Representation and self-representation are its essential modes through which communities are formed. How others perceive the community has obvious consequences that in some cases are a matter of life and death. The news media has a way to reinforce those through the delivery of images that focus entirely on the image of the victim. While the incident at Naren Barrett would suggest that there is a, also a fair amount of agency, but that remains largely hidden by official representation. Already at the time, there were certain figures men who would steal away from the camps at night, across the Lebanese topography, infiltrate the border between Lebanon and Palestine, go back to their villages, for instance. Of particular interest is this one figure whose wife was said to have stayed in the village while he ran away in 48, and then the borders were closed. So he would go back, he would sleep with his wife, he would come back to Lebanon and she would get pregnant. Year after year she would continue having children and the Israeli securities there. They wanted at once to denounce her to the villagers that look, there's this woman here who's unaccounted for who's bearing children, by whom the villagers knew what was going on. And it's this kind of image of the virile man who manages to cut through all obstacles to reach the motherland. Make it fertile. In clandestinity. In clandestinity uh, against all odds. From a position of weakness, so to speak, but who overcomes this weakness.
كأنه رصاصة فرجت على الأرض وشطت لي صدري بالطول. ظلت المواجهة شي ساعة وبعدين تفرقوا الشباب وأصحابي سحبوني على المستشفى. الوجع كان قوي كثير بس الجرح ما كان غميق. حظ منيح إنه الرصاصة مرقت مرقت جنب طلعت فيه. ولا على كيف يعني ما كنت هون اليوم In view of keeping a community alive and remembering how they came into being, it is necessary to create mythologies. There are many such stories in circulation that speak of a time when borders were porous and penetrable. Things were still in the forming stage. These mythologies speak of creative personal forms of resistance that do not struggle against the very site of oppression, that do not necessarily involve grand gestures of opposition, but invent a kind of resistance that opens up alternative forms of life. Resistance comes as a, a mode through which the symptoms of the different power relations are diagnosed and ways are sought to get around them, live through them, or change them. لي خمس سنين في رام الله بس تربيت في كنش بيت لحم وامي وابوي لساهم عايشين هناك عمي محمود عايش بسوريا بس معه شوراء عنده ثمان اولاد سمر سامي حسن احمد رجا مش متذكره باقي الاسامي عندي ابن عم عايش بمصر عنده ثلاث اولاد عصام قاسم عائلة عمي عايشة في الأردن معظمهم عايشين في مخيم جنب إربل عندي أولاد عم بجيالي عمار وميفات وشيرين عمي حسن عايش في أمريكا ترك البلاد من زمان بس مرت فلسطينية وتربت بواشنطن عائلتها أصلها من حيفا عمي وعائلته عايشين هلا بتوليدو أوهايو وبنات عمي دارا وماي بروح على الجامعة هناك بس كل صيف بيجوا زيارة على البلاد أخوي عيسى بدرس في فرنسا وإلي أسبوع مش حاكي معه خالتي الكبيرة ليلى عايشة في بيروت اتجوزت فلسطيني لبناني وعندهم أربع أولاد Palestinian refugees and exiles are mostly in neighboring states, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, and Egypt, but also in large communities scattered around the world. How Palestinians negotiate a space now and build a nation outside the territory should not be perceived only as negative, as a trap, as being outside of something. Their transnational experience is one of the most important resources they have in order to build a future for themselves. Given the vital importance of this connectivity, the Palestinian refugee is placed here in the context of a global diaspora and reflects on post-national models of belonging, which have emerged through the network matrix of this translocal community. This website, it's called the Cross Borders. The idea uh, of creating this website is to have like a um, connection between 11 refugee camps in the West Bank, this, uh, Gaza, and Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. We are now in the Haitian refugee camp website. When we just click here, Al Jalazan website, which it is another refugee camp close to Ramallah. And you know that sometimes we can't move between the Russian cities. So if I come to this website, I can see some daily news about the, what's going on there. And this is something very important for us as Palestinian refugees who, who live inside the refugee camp. We have parents who live in Lebanon. I can come here and just check this website. I, I can know everything about what's going on in the refugee camps in Lebanon.
The refugee camp must be apprehended as a spatial device of containment that deprives people of their mobility with the goal to condemn them to a localized existence. All the while, like any other major diasporic society, the Palestinian community has devised all sorts of ways to build a transnational network that allows them to negotiate the juridical zones that they are not allowed to enter or in which they are forced to stay by breaking them, overcoming them, and finding ways around them. How they do that can almost be seen as a laboratory for other stateless and transnational groups, whether they are refugees or migrant laborers, or people who, who, who simply find themselves outside certain spaces that they have long known. What my research brings to light is that the attempt to confine people to a bounded space typically, typically instigates a heightened desire to connect across distances and activate new, new forms of translocal contact. The refugee camp harbors an intense microcosm of complex relations to the homeland and to related communities abroad. There is a lively inter-camp and inter-diasporic communication going on among the widely dispersed Palestinian communities. A territory is no longer just a formal spatial arrangement, but also a complex system of large-scale networks. He says that the only difference between people inside and outside the camp is that the camp dwellers have a UN card and the citizens have a regular ID, meaning that they are normal people who have the right to be here. He says that in any case, the camp is nothing more than a waiting room until they get the right to return. And that if he talks about the right to return, he really means the right to choose. Give me the right and I will choose, he says. The choice to go back, the choice to stay in a refugee camp, or the choice to go elsewhere. He says that he likes France, for instance, and that he has spent six years of his life in France. He likes Paris. Maybe he will decide to live there. And if he opted to go back to his village, what would he do there? He says that he doesn't know how to plant a tree. In the refugee camp, he is very active. He makes theater, music, and media workshops. But back in the village, what would he do? He would have to start all over again, live in a tent, and rebuild his entire life. Shady says that the first eviction took people from their roots and threw them in this kind of condition. They didn't only force the people to leave. They forced the cultural self to leave with them, the way they used to live. Look at this camp, where is the space? Someone who used to have many acres of land has now only 72 square meters the size of his house. There is no land at all, he says. are just clips that I chose from the video, which is, basic, which is mostly based in a series of, of interviews with scholars. So I, uh, I noticed that in the Middle East, um, uh, you find a lot of intellectuals, and it's a terrain that is very overrepresented. Um, and that um, I felt I wanted to just layer the discourses one on top of each other because there is such a, den there is a, a density of knowledge production about this space. So um, this was my way to proceed. Um, out of this project, uh, of this video research, um, emerged a collaboration with Shuru Kar, who is the Arabic voice in this video. Um, and we founded together um, a, a little blog called Art Territories, 
Dotnet, um, because we were thinking about um, the fact that the art discourse in the Arab world is extremely dominated or driven by foreign forces, foreign capital, you know, people from the Gulf, from the West are investing big time in this region. And, um, and the fact also that uh, usually artists in the Middle East do not have a local ed art education. And if they go abroad, they do not, for instance, an art student in, um, in Ramallah or in Beirut, they would not go to Cairo or to another Middle Eastern country to study. They would automatically go to Paris or to London. So that these, grow these, these, fun uh, these, these forming years uh, are usually spent abroad and there is no ability therefore to create really um, a community among um, Arab artists very easily. They meet at foreign exhibitions and so on, but it's very difficult to create a common discourse. Discourse is imported and driven from abroad. And so we thought that creating a blog where um, artists would interview other artists that they're interested in, in the region, and start really um, discussing their work from a personal interest and find out what their references are, what their ideas are, why they pursue certain things, was going to be a very simple idea, but actually one that could uh, help uh, the community uh, get a bit of on firmer ground. And, um, and so we started this blog. It opened, um, <coughs> it was launched at the Liverpool Biennial uh, last year. And uh, it really started to take off very quickly because we noticed that I I even very good artists, actually, uh, Hassan Khan, Bassam El Baroni, I mean, all these people have um, actually not, uh, there is no venue in the Arab world where they can actually speak about their ideas or about a critique of uh, current art institutions or <coughs> cultural practices at large, you know. Um, because usually they are just picked uh, as, as representative artists from uh, certain localities. And, um, and there is a discourse developed around them, but that doesn't really relate necessarily to their, to their real concerns. So um, that's, what we, that's what we did. Um, but since the presentation was shortened a little bit, I thought I would concentrate more on the video work. So thank you very much. Any comments or questions? Yes, we have a yeah, thank you very much. Um, where is the um, film as a whole, or video, available? Um, well, it's, it's, it's on YouTube, and I have okay. uh, a fair amount of uh, writing done about it. Um, there is also some, there's actually a nice little collection of these clips at, um, at Tate Modern. They have a kind of a, a new media project. So if you Google X Mission, X, mm -hmm. um, um, how do you say, English? Yes. Minus, Minus. Yeah. mission, you'll yes. find it very easily. Or just go on my Alexa le website, uh, geobodies.org. All the projects are described there. Do we have another comment here? It's just a question whether I understood you rightly. You mentioned that foreign capital invests highly in the discourse around contemporary Arab um, art. And you mentioned the Gulf countries in that context. And uh, the Sharjah Biennial, Abu Dhabi, mm. Um, Dubai art, mm. um, all those um, art fairs that are coming up in the uh, region of the Middle East, of course, in the richer countries or in the richer region, regions, they have developed highly in the last couple of years, I think. And so the second part of the question is, why did you launch your project as part of the Liverpool Biennial and not in Charger, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, or another uh, place in the region? Yeah, we weren't really thinking that this project would gain any any uh, significant visibility. We just wanted to get involved in speaking with each other, you know. But then there was this um, 
uh, exhibition that took uh, exhibition on the Arab world that was invited as a guest exhibition at the biennial, and they knew about us, and then they invited Shuruk to come and present the project I in the framework of a presentation of other local initiatives. So, and at the Sharjah Biennial, we actually also in March, we were at the March meetings and we spoke about uh, these initiatives um, together with, you know, 40 other initiatives. So, uh, you, you can see emerging a lot of these web projects that some of them um, are mainly based in creating platforms for artists and archives, there's a heavy focus on archives because all the visual material disappears constantly, it's very hard to get a hold of. And um, yeah, so in, in that frame we have. So why did you consider Gulf money as for the investment in the Arab context? Uh, well, I think that the, you know, Sharjah and other places are really quite a driving force in, in, in starting collections. Mm -hmm. In, in defining the parameters for collecting qualities. Um, um, and the new museum there that is being uh, developed, I mean, this, it's very obvious that, that the Gulf wants to establish itself as a place of cultural and scientific exchange and, and power. And so in that sense, you know, it's, we've seen just the beginning, yeah. So in, I think it's important to also uh, create counter platform, not counter platforms, but other platforms where people can speak outside of these very uh, slick, defined spaces. You know. Where. Um, art strategies are presented that are maybe more performative, more fragile, less, less market oriented, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Excuse me? I mean, there are also like more independent uh, places like Bastakia that is happening always parallel to Art Dubai. And so it's not as if uh, everything that happens in the Gulf is just like market oriented with like Sotheby's or, um, no, or Christie's no. or something like that. No, no. There are a I lot of independent initiatives in the yeah. region. And so I was just wondering whether you are um, um, investigating on those at all. Uh, well, but they are just parallel existences to what we do. You know, I don't want to demonize. I, I have nothing against those, those developments. It's just that I also hear a lot of others who do not wa want, you know, they feel a little um, um, pushed also and, and allured and triggered into working in a certain, along a certain lines when maybe, you know, becoming more involved in local activities is also an option. Mm -hmm. and, and those need to be discussed somewhere. Those need to be amplified and, and circulating, so uh, in, that, in that way. Just a comment for a bit of context, because something you said for me seemed odd when said out of context as someone doesn't know much about the Arab world. Um, I mean, concerning the artists and their exchange with each other between the Arab world, but also in how far they're represented or not in the country itself, I think is a bit complicated to say, to be said just like this because of also the art forms they use, which for me, sometimes seem very um, somehow driven by the Western con discourse in itself. I mean, it's not only that they're then taken within the West and discussed, but also the, the art form is somehow very cut up from the society and separated. Um, so it, it somehow started in ideas from elsewhere. And then uh, with, for example, in Egypt, like, a, at least 40% of direct illiteracy <laughs> becomes very strange that they can then have more of a discourse with the society, but also then with other artists in the Arab world, I find, mm -hmm. uh, for some artists. So I, 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 I don't know. I mean, it's a very complicated relationship, this issue of 
funding and the fact that it comes from the West and then who yeah. does what, where, it and how it's connected. Yeah. I mean, they... Um, we started this almost two years ago when we started to conceptualize this project. And, um, and of course, a lot has happened since then, you know? Uh, and I, I guess we have to um, think about how, how the revolution is also changing this whole scene quite a bit, because um, I think in Egypt, uh, the art is suddenly seen as something a lot more relevant and maybe socially visible than it has ever been before because so many artists and designers and, and, and so on are actually on the front line of the, of the revolution. And we have yet to see what will come of that, you know? Is there going to be more of a, a direct uh, social engagement of art that will be accepted by the, by the population? Or, or how can this now, how will this develop? I, I have no idea. I don't know. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, we don't know. I mean, it's but I think it has to do a lot with the fact that the artists themselves, the ones that were very separated, either changed somehow the kind of work they do, and the fact that the ones that are appearing are using more popular and re-inventing -in yeah, sort of art forms yeah. and media sure. to create something that cre because they see now this necessity to communicate more with the society. Um, so I, I don't know if it's about them being on the front line, but I think it's them being also in themselves more interested in a conversation with the masses, so to say. Yeah, sure, out of necessity, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting, the ex-mission is really about the Palestinian refugee camp. Um, with, the, with the first and for foremost that the desire to to kind of uh, speak about this refugee camp other than always in relation to the conflict or to Israel, mm -hmm. and to start maybe placing it in the context of other globalized movements mm -hmm. that create very similar conditions. Um, and so a lot of effort in this video goes there to, to link it to other transnational phenomena. Um, and I think uh, it is quite successful in doing that. Now, this video was mostly finished in 2008, then I added another chapter in 2009, but it is really just before the revolution. Now, after, I think I would have a lot more options in placing it into another uh, in regional context that would be very interesting to think about. Um, but uh, as it is, it, it's something that happened just before. <laughs> Thank you very much.